Ford. You are listening to Based in Fact, a true crime podcast. Join host Lisa O'Brien and Kyle Evans as they examine America's most infamous true crime cases as they were established in our courts and the basis for the decisions of the appeals courts, not the court of public opinion. Here's Lisa and Kyle. Welcome to season two of Based in Fact, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Lisa O'Brien, and I'm joined by Kyle Evans, my co-host. This is episode three, State of Texas versus Joseph Andrew Prystash. This is part two of our look at the November 9th, 1994 murder for hire of Farrah Baca Frada, a mother of three gunned down in a garage in Humble, Texas, Harris County. In part one, we talked about the case against Frada's, Farrah's estranged husband, Robert Frada, who was executed on January 10th, 2023. In part two, we're going to talk about the middleman, Joseph Prystash, a fellow, a felon and gym rat with Frada at the President and First Lady Health Club in Harris County. We'll talk about the evidence against Prystash, his capital murder conviction, direct appeals, and state and federal post-conviction claims. While we did intend to look at Gidry's case in that discussion as well, I bit off more than I could chew in the research, and Kyle and I decided to add a part three rather than rushing through a discovery of the case, a discussion of the case against Gidry. And good afternoon, Kyle. How are you? I'm doing well, Lisa. Good afternoon. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, yeah, you're getting said before the show, enjoying uh, enjoying some of the uh, ten or fifteen really great <laughs> days we get in Texas, where it's cool enough to sit on the patio and enjoy the a little sunshine. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, I think you said it's day two. Yeah, day two exactly. Of your yearly allotment of good days. <laughs> yeah, of our few <laughs> days of really great weather. All right, so. Um... Uh, as I said, we're going to go ahead and we're just going to talk about Price Dash today, and then we'll conclude with a look at the case against Gidry next week, or week after next, because you're going to be gone on spring break next week. Yeah, that's right. Yep. It's so fast. It's amazing how fast time flies already spring break time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in March. So, yeah, the, the days fly by when you're grown. <laughs> they really do, right? <laughs> yeah. So, all right. <clears throat> of course, today, uh, tonight, we're talking about uh, the victim in this case was Farah Famida Bakker Frada. She was born August 5th, 1961, in Guilford Borough, which is in Surrey, England. Her parents are Lex Syed Bakker, who died in February 2018, and her mother is Betty Bakker. She had one brother, Zane. She worked as a ticket agent with American Airlines. She married Robert Frada in May of 1983 and filed for divorce in March of 1992. Uh, we talked about the grounds and, and the issues in that last week or two weeks ago. I keep forgetting I'm not doing this every week. Uh, she had two sons, Bradley and Daniel born in 1986 and 1988, and then a daughter, Amber, born in 1990, and her injury cause of death was a gunshot wound or two gunshot wounds to the head. Our perpetrator for this week or this episode is Joseph Andrew Prystash. He was born September 5th, 1956 in Youngstown, Ohio. His parents were Joseph Andrew Prystash. But it's interesting, he doesn't go by junior and his father didn't go by senior, which is very okay. strange. Yeah, that is strange. Um, his father was uh, born December 15th, 1926. He died May 31st, 2009. Price Dash's mother, Alma Jean Price Dash, her maiden name was Bledsoe, was um, born 
January 7th, 1930, and she died February 16th, 1974. Um, according to Price Stash's penalty phase, or summary of his penalty phase uh, testimony, apparently his father was a workaholic and his mother drank and was an ex exceptionally cruel person. And she died from cancer in 1974 when he would have been 18 years old. Oh, so his mother, did you say his mother was really mean? Yes. Oh, gosh. According to some of the family members who testified, um, not necessarily at the punishment stage hearing, but in post-conviction or in the, the evidence and the affidavit submitted by those family members. Uh, he has one sister. He earned a GED and he was, uh, he did join the United States Marine Corps. I don't know the year that he joined, but he was uh, disciplinarily discharged in 1976. Uh, probably would have been um, around 1974, maybe 1973. He was in some, he had some criminal history. So uh, and probably juvenile history that might have led to him joining the Marine Corps because right. a lot of times in the 60s and 70s, a lot of juvenile judges would say, if you join the service, we'll kind of we'll we'll forgive look at you the, yeah we'll we'll uh let you go he was married twice the first time to Lori young in 1980 around 1981 to 1983 um and with Lori young he had one daughter he also married a lady named tamora sutton sometime in the mid 1980s and they were married for less than a year both of his ex-wives described him as antisocial, self-centered, having no conscience, using other people, moody and jealous with no remorse, uh, which are kind of hallmarks of an antisocial personality right. disorder. Kind of want to know y'all didn't figure that out before you said <laughs> to the dress. Well, <laughs> but you know, the 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 thing is, like Frada, Price Dash can probably be very engaging and very charming. Right. And then, and you're the most important thing in his life until you're yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. You see that kind of like the Ted Bundy is probably the most mm -hmm. famous, right? Super Jody Arias. Handsome. Yeah, nice. And then, you know, um, Jody Arias is another one. Uh, that, and that's also a hallmark of borderline personality disorder. Right. Um, so his prior crimes are, he's quite lengthy criminal record. Uh, but one mystery from last week is solved. Uh, he was, um, let's see, convicted of six counts of burglary of a structure in Grand Larceny in Dade County, Florida in 1977. He had an unadjudicated aggravated robbery offense uh, that occurred in October 1983 in Montgomery County, Texas. He had speeding and failure to maintain proof of insurance in December in 1983 in Harris County, Texas. He had unauthorized use of a motor vehicle conviction, uh, which he received four years probation and had his probation revoked on July 21st, 1988, which sent him to the Texas Department of Justice for um, three years. He had unlawful carrying of a weapon in May of 1988. Uh, theft in also in May 1988, burglary of a habitation on June 28, 1994 at 19610 Forest Fern in Humble, Texas. Uh, that was the attack on Farrah Frada, probably uh, instigated by Robert Frada. That's my speculation, but mm -hmm. um, he had attempted murder, aggravated assault charge, in Conroe, Texas, in June of 1981, that was uh, apparently nearly killed his sister's boyfriend. And then he had a general discharge for disciplinary reasons from the United States Marine Corps in around 1976. So um, 
uh, price dash. Oh, oh, sorry. His juvenile record goes on. Um, he had juvenile probation for burglary in Dade County, Florida, when he was 12. Juvenile probation for for burglary in Dade County when he was 14. Uh, he apparently had an unadjudicated assault on an individual who gave Robert Frada a bad check. And that occurred in Harris County. That was according to a statement Price Dash made to one of the other gym guys, uh, Podorsky. He was accused of selling steroids to John Ruiz at the Roman Health Spa in the 1980s. And he also was arrested for possession of steroids in Harris County in about 1985 and 1996. And he admitted to repeated steroid use since 1983. Well, that's going to help your mental health. Yeah. And uh, his victim was, again, Farah Fami Debakar Frada. Yeah, he seems like kind of one of these, you know, stereotype, the kind of the 80s gym guy. <laughs> yeah, 80s gym rat. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, it's funny, but we'll kind of get into this a little later. But when he was initially questioned, he alleged that you know, he didn't hang out with Frada because he was a felon and Frada was a cop. And he said he didn't like Frada because of the way Frada acted and Frada was conceited and Frada, he thought Frada was gay. Um, but obviously that wasn't true because another hallmark of antisocial personality is that they can lie and it doesn't bother them to lie. <laughs> so. All right, so the summary of the crime, it occurred at 19610 Forest Fern in Humble, Texas. I was saying Atascacita, but apparently Atascacita is the, the area and the, the town name is Humble. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that area was a huge, was blowing up back in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it was, it became a, like a bedroom Houston, community for yeah. Houston. Yep, absolutely. So, um, although, as with Houston, everything is miles and miles <laughs> apart. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I visited Houston in college. And we drove like an hour and a half to go to a club. Oh, I could believe that. Well, I, I bet, you know, I bet Humble is probably, yeah, it's probably a good 45 minutes from downtown without traffic. Yeah. And we were like, we were going to the club at 10 o'clock at night, you know. Yeah, it um, is a big, big place. Really, mm -hmm. really spread out. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, summary of the crime. During contentious divorce and child custody proceeding, Robert Frada hatched a plan to kill Farah, his estranged wife. Frada threatened to kill Farah, telling several people that he believed he would get away with the crime or he would serve little time if he was convicted. He also approached multiple, multiple people at the President and First Lady Health Club, seeking someone else to murder Farah. He bragged that the number of people he approached would muddy the waters for investigators because they would have multiple suspects to pursue. On June 28, 1994, Price Dash, wearing dark clothing and a mask, entered through a window in Farrah's house at 19610 Forest Fern in Humble, Texas. He attacked Farrah in her bed, shocking her multiple times with a stun gun. When Farrah's children banged on the bedroom door, shouting at him to leave their mom alone, Price Dash stopped his assault and went out the window he used to enter the house, which was later found to have been tampered with from the outside. Investigators believe that the attack on Farah was instigated by Frada, but they were unable to identify the intruder or develop evidence giving them probable cause to arrest him. As a court hearing date in late November approached, Pry Stash, a fellow gym rat, agreed to act as a middleman and find a trigger man to commit the murder. Frada promised Pry Stash a Jeep and promised to pay the trigger man $1,000 as an initial payment and more once he collected proceeds from Farah's life insurance. Price Dash's neighbor, Howard Guidry, took the job to earn money to buy cocaine for later sale. Frada planned the murder to happen while the children were with him on a Wednesday night. Frada also provided the weapon that would be used to kill Farah. On Wednesday, November 9, 1994, Price Dash 
using information provided by Frada, drove Gidry to a local grocery store where they tested the outside pay phones and a cell phone provided to Price Dash by his girlfriend, Mary Gibb. Price Dash left the cell phone with Gidry, who was waiting in a playhouse at Ferris House. After dropping Gidry off, Price Dash returned to the grocery store parking lot to wait for a call from Gidry once Farrah was dead. In one call to Price Dash, Gid Gidry advised that Farrah hadn't come home yet and was instructed to wait. Phone records establish that during the evening, there were multiple calls of pages between Price Dash and Frada, who took the children to a local Catholic church after dinner. As Farrah backed her car into the garage, Gidry left the playhouse entered the garage, and shot Farrah once in the head as she got out of her car. When he heard Farrah moaning, Gidry shot her a second time after she fell. Using the cell phone, Gidry called Price Dash on the grocery store payphone. Neighbors briefly observed Gidry as he waited for his ride, then watched as a small four-door silver car arrive to pick him up. The car, a Nissan belonging to Price Dash, was noted to have a burned-out front headlight. Price Dash initially replaced the headlight, then had the car crushed. Because of their contentious divorce and custody issues and Frada's cold demeanor, he was a prime suspect from the beginning. Frada was released after questioning because he didn't make any admissions. Although he made no criminating admissions, he later claimed that he was abused by detectives during questioning. Phone records obtained through the, during the early days in the investigation led to Gip and Price Dash and members of the same gym as Frada. Price Dash was questioned by police on November 18, 1994, and denied any knowledge of the murder. Like Frada, he made no incriminating statements, but later claimed that de detectives abused him during his time at the homicide office. On November 21, 1994, detectives questioned Gip and her brother Keith, who each corroborated the alibi given by Price Dash, who claimed they'd all watched an ice skating program on the night of Farrah's murder. Once Price Dash claimed to have been beaten by police, Gip refused to cooperate further with detectives. After Price Dash was questioned by police and anticipating a search of Gip's apartment, he gave the gun to Gidry, who said he would dispo dispose of it in a lake or other body of water. Instead, Gidry decided to keep the gun, perhaps because Frada hadn't paid him. Police had phone records tying Frada to Price Dash and Gip but they lacked the additional evidence required to establish probable cause to arrest any of them, especially in the absence of inculpatory statements from either Frada or Price Dash. On March 1st, 1995, Gidry was arrested after a bank robbery and the gun used to kill Farrah was still in his possession. Unaware of Gidry's role in the crime, Harris County Sheriff's investigators still lacked the pieces of the puzzle that would connect Gidry to Frada and Price Dash and later to Farrah's murder. On that same day, faced with a grand jury subpoena and the threat of potential criminal charges for tampering with evidence, Gip decided to cooperate, and she and her attorney, George Parnum, worked out a deal with the prosecutor who granted her immunity on the tampering charges. On March 4, 1995, Gip made a statement that provided many of the details that would connect the dots between the phone and pager records and the murder for hire of Fara Frada. Gibbs' information also led police to the final piece of the puzzle, the serial number of the gun, which irrefutably tied the weapon to Frada. Based on Gibbs' statements, detectives obtained a statement from Gidry, who was still being held on the bank robbery charges. Gidry detailed his part in the murder and accompanied detectives on a crime scene visit, giving a videotaped statement detailing how he murdered Farah on November 9, 1994. After Gidry's statement, a pocket warrant was issued on March 8, 1995, and Price Dash was picked up again by detectives. During questioning at the station, Price Dash refused to make any statements. Without an inculpatory admission, police decided to release him. While he was being driven back to his vehicle, Price Dash initiated a conversation with Detective Billingsley finally confessing his part in Farrah's murder for hire and confirming police suspicions about Frada's part in the plot. With the promise to come in for a formal statement the following day, Price Dash was released. When he failed to appear for a statement, a new warrant was issued on March 13, 1995, and Price Dash was again arrested. In a so, written statement, yes. I'm sorry, no, I don't mean to interrupt, but just to mm -hmm. 
clarify. So he confesses to the policeman. Correct. And then they just let him go home and promise to come back tomorrow. Correct. Um, it was really strange. I, I think it was Price Stash's effort to play the system a little bit. Um, while the detective could have arrested him and brought him back in right there on the spot, he was trying to develop a rapport with him. And of course, if he brought him back to the station, Price Dash would just deny ever making the statement. Right. I guess so. What he was doing was trying to develop a rapport and letting him go ahead and go home and get his shit together and then come back and make a formal statement, which would then result in his arrest and booking into jail um and, so, and really back a little bit earlier all of this is really because of his girlfriend mary Gipp, who started to talk correct she was facing i think that the detectives thought because she had prior knowledge of the murder plot i think detectives thought that she could be that could be held over her head. But in reality, the most that they really had her on was tampering with evidence. Right. So, and I mean, I, I don't mean to be flippant, but I'm still, I mean, I realize your average, these guys, you know, especially, you know, they're the Hans and Franz of the Saturday Night Live, you know, at the gym, they're not getting yeah. presidents of the local Mensa. But why do you tell your girlfriend that you're involved in a murder for hire plot? Like, I'm just, I'm amazed that these people just talk. Well, I think he knew she wouldn't talk. She was afraid. And, and Kelly Siegler, the, the, the district attorney has, um, has speculated that Mary Gipp was so desperate to keep price stash in her life that she wouldn't talk she would do anything that's great yeah. and i think gib also had some substance abuse and alcohol problems right yeah that would make sense so um but yeah i mean it is it, it's farah's family is not happy with her because she could have warned farah exactly right and then farah could have taken precautions you know, Farrah could have had her dad meeting her at home. She could have moved in with her parents. Exactly. And left that house, you know. But Gip chose that Kip Gip didn't want to lose Price Dash or she was afraid of him. Either or. Right. Um but uh she finally did do the right thing. So I guess we have to give her a little tiny yeah, bit of a little bit. Uh, because she's the one who connected all of the dots that police were never able to connect. Um, when Price Stash failed to appear for a statement, a new warrant was issued on March 13, 1995, and Price Stash was again arrested. In a written statement, Price Stash laid out the entire plan, including the fact that November 9th, 1994, was chosen as the date to kill Frada, Farah because the children would be with Frada. Price Dash also admitting to using his own vehicle and disposing of it. He admitted that he was promised Frada's Jeep. He also admitted that Frada told him the money promised to Gidry had been seized by police when they searched his vehicle in November. Finally, Price Dash advised that Frada brought the gun to him three days before Farah's murder. So again, in addition to the serial number, Linking the gun back to Frada because it went from Frada's hands to Price Dash's hands to Gidry's hands. Um, Price Dash was arrested on March 13, 1995, by the Harris County Sheriff's Office. He was initially charged with capital murder on March 13, 1995, through a charging instrument by the district attorney. He was indicted on June 2nd, 1995 for capital murder by the grand jury. Uh, they re-indicted him on May 17th, 1996 for capital murder. And I've looked at the indictments and I've compared them and I can't see what the distinction is. Hmm. Um, 
I may have just been missing it, but um, the so the uh, the initial June second ninety five indictment was then dismissed on June sixth nineteen ninety six because he had been reindicted, uh, and I think they ended up reindicting Frada and reindicting Gidry as well. So, and I'll I'll see when I look at Gidry's case, I'll see if I can figure out what what the reindictment yeah maybe some just was strange um and unfortunately very few of the records are online with harris county because they haven't they haven't scanned in and uploaded their 1990s cases mm. so the trial was in the 230th district court of harris county texas the judge was the honorable robert n Bur burdett the counsel for the state was Kelly Siegler and Casey O'Brien. Counsel for Price Dash was Robert Morrow and Gerald Bork. Uh, they did file a motion to suppress, suppress Pot Price Dash's statements on June 4th, 1996. Um, or they filed it in 1996. The hearing was held on June 4th. Um, their judge issued findings of fact and conclusions of law on June 27th, 1996, which essentially found that um, denied the motion to suppress that state process statements were all voluntary and his waivers of rights were knowingly made. Um, the trial began on June 21st, they did voir dire, which is picking a jury from June 21st to June 27th, 1996. The guilt innocence phase uh, went from June 1st to June 3rd, 1996. They had a break, which was probably over 4th of July, and then they came back for two more days on June 8th and 9th. I mean, July 8th and 9th, pardon me. Uh, the verdict was issued on June, July that's pretty, 9th. That's a pretty quick trial, right? For a yeah, murder, especially a murder trial where, you know, I mean, I know we talked, you did a lot more than just the middleman, but, you know, when you didn't actually pull the trigger and there's a little bit of a complexity, that seems like a really quick trial. Well, I, I don't think for, for price dash, I don't think it really was as, uh, as complicated because he, talked a lot to mary gibb yeah and there probably wasn't much of a defense right you probably there's not a lot you can do um no and unfortunately i i would have loved to have and and they've got his his incriminating statements um so you know his incriminating statements are just corroborated everything else is gravy right that's fair um but uh i i, I do wish i knew more about um but the limitations because of the age of the case um i can only figure out so much from their docket sheets and i could and i could be wrong <laughs> so um so yeah, they they found him guilty of capital murder and then they went into the penalty phase which was july 9th to july 10th and uh Price Dash was sentenced to death on July 10th. A motion for new trial was filed on August 9th, 1996. The state filed a motion. Apparently, when they filed the motion for new trial, they subpoenaed the jurors or some of the jurors to appear at the hearing on the motion. Um, the state filed a motion to release the jurors from subpoenas on September 13th, 1996. A hearing was held on uh, September 19th. The motion was filed the 13th, pardon me, and the hearing was the 19th of September. The jurors were released from subpoenas because an affidavit in support of the motion for new trial made no allegations of juror misconduct. So, uh, and that's pretty standard. If you're, if you're going to talk to the jurors or try to talk to the jurors um, or uh, compel the jurors to appear and talk at a hearing, you have to allege juror misconduct. Right. Um, and on 
the same date, the 19th of September, the motion for new trial was denied. Uh, again, I can't I can't get the actual motion, so I don't know what the um, the full grounds were. Um, then we have direct appeal. Uh, the state was represented by John B. Holmes. Price staff was still being represented by Robert Morrow. Um, he had 17 points of error in his appeal. I'm going to run through them real quick. First of all, he had a an error claim related to voir dire, which was point of error number 17, that the trial court erroneously denied a challenge for cause against a veneer member WB, who Price Dash claimed was biased against a phase of the law in violation of Article 35.16 C2, he argued that WB refused to acknowledge that the society in the future dangerous special issue included prison society. Related to the guilt phase, he had a point of review that wasn't, wasn't uh, listed as a formal point of error. Um, he alleged that he had subpoenaed employment records of a sheriff's deputy, believing that the records would contain favorable evidence about the witnesses interrogation practices, quote, unquote. The trial court, finding no evidence favorable to appellant, ruled that the records would not be given to him. Then in uh, punishment phase testimony, which was the third, I guess, section of his appeal, uh, point of error number three, the trial court erred by excluding from the jury during the punishment phase of his trial the prosecutor's plea offer of 55 years. He argued that a plea offer of 55 years as, as opposed to an offer of life is mitigating evidence relevant to the jury's determination of special issue number two and that it reflects that the prosecutor did not believe the appellant to be a continuing danger to society. Um, now, actually, I believe in 1994, there was no life sentence. Life was 30-something years or 40 years. So. Yeah, that seems right. I think you're right. I, I, I don't believe. So 55 years was actually more than life at that time. Um. Point of error number four, the trial court excluded part of the testimony of Dr. Walter Cajano from the jury during sentencing. The proposed testimony of Dr. Cajano would have been that he would not consider the appellant to be a continuing threat while in prison. Dr. Cajano based his opinion on the appellant's current jail classification as nonviolent. The offense with which the appellant was charged and the level of resources that the prison system possesses to control the danger of inmates. Then he moved on to uh, errors he claimed in the punishment phase instructions. Now, to kind of, I have to do an intro for this because the uh, points of error don't adequately summarize it. Um, one of the uh, Article 37.071, Section 2B2, requires that at the punishment stage, the court shall submit the following issue to the jury, whether the defendant actually caused the death of the deceased or did not actually cause the death of the deceased, but intended to kill the deceased or another or anticipated that a human life would be taken. Price Stash's counsel, however argued that special issue number two was unconstitutional. And on those grounds, he uh, argued to the court that he did not want that question asked. While the judge didn't agree that the issue was unconstitutional, he omitted the issue from the jury charge. Uh, the state did not object to that request by the defense, uh, nor did they submit the issue themselves. Points of error one and two, Price Dash argued that the trial court erred in failing to submit the issue in the jury charge and in accepting the verdict without an answer to the issue. And he relied on a case called Powell versus State, 897 Southwest 2nd 307. That was from the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, and it was decided in 1994. 
Point of error number nine, he argued that the trial court's refusal to the to instruct the jury that a life sentence would be imposed if they failed to answer a special issue was reversible error. Point of error number 10, he claimed that the trial judge erroneously refused to instruct the jury that they could not consider unadjudicated offenses during the punishment phase unless the prosecution had proven them beyond a reasonable doubt. Point of error number 11, the trial court erred in refusing to give an instruction to the jury that limited their consideration of other bad acts to the future dangerousness special issue. Point of error number 12, the trial court erred in refusing a limiting instruction that the jury disregard evidence of the commission of the primary offense in deciding whether he had committed other bad acts. The other bad acts to which the appellant refers are an aggravated robbery of a car salesperson, a dismissed charge of attempted murder of his brother-in-law, and the burglary of the victim's house and assault on the victim before the instant murder. Point of error number 13 was that the trial court erred in refusing to submit special verdict forms to the jury that would specify whether they had found each of the unadjudicated offenses to have been committed. The appellant claims that this court cannot perform a meaningful sufficiency review of the jury's answer to the future dangerousness special issue without answers to the requested special verdict forms. Point of error number 14, the trial court erroneously refused his request that the jury be charged that they may consider any evidence to be mitigating, even if irrelevant, to the moral culpability of the defendant. He claims that his requested his requested charge was necessary to correct the definition of mitigating evidence in article 37.071 section 2f4 which unconstitutionally limits the def definition of mitigating evidence to evidence that reduces the appellant's moral blameworthiness then he challenged the special issues in the next section which were uh the mitigation at punishment uh, claiming that the mitigation issue at punishment as set forth in Article 37.071, Section 2E, violated the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, in point of error number five, he argued that the mitigation issue unconstitutionally omits a burden of proof. The appellant acknowledged that the case law was against him, but presented an argument that he claimed the TCCA had overlooked in previous decisions. The appellant argued that the mitigation special issue permits introduction of non-statutory aggravating evidence in addition to mitigating evidence, and this non-statutory aggravating evidence is not subject to a burden of proof in violation of Walton versus Arizona, which is the 1990 U.S. Supreme Court case. The non-statutory evidence of which the appellant primarily complained was the introduction of victim impact evidence. Point of error number six, the mitigation special issue is unconstitutional because it fails to provide meaningful appellate review of the jury's decision. Point of error number seven, Article 44.251A requires that the mitigation special issue be subject to appellate review. Point of error number eight, requiring 10 votes for the jury to return a negative answer to the first special issue an affirmative answer to the third special issue violates the Eighth Amendment. The appellant complained that the majority of the jury could improperly pressure an individual juror who wanted to vote for life instead of death. Point of error number 16 was that the trial court denied effective assistance of counsel by advising the jurors that they were under no obligation to answer any questions regarding their service. And point of error number 15, the trial court denied effective assistance of counsel by releasing the jurors from defense subpoenas issued for a motion for new trial. Uh, on November 5th, 1997, the uh, court granted a request to supplement the record. Uh, a supplemental court record was filed on December 5th, 1997. The case was submitted on briefs on November uh, on September 9th, 1997. And Lisa, what does that mean when they talk about the granted to the supplement record? What does that mean? Just adding new. It means, yeah, it means record. that there was something in the trial court record that didn't get sent up with the record on appeal inadvertently or because it wasn't designated by 
one party or the other, but that during the course of briefing, one or both parties realize it, it's an important thing to consider. And so they ask that the record be supplemented to add that. Um, yeah. You'll also see it sometimes the Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, I believe it was Rodney Reed's case. They asked for several exhibits entered at the July 2019 or July 2021 hearings to be submitted to the Court of Criminal Appeals, the originals to be submitted. Because whatever they received as part of the record wasn't wasn't in a uh, wasn't good enough for them to review. So it it can be one party or the other realizes something was inadvertently not sent, was not designated inadvertently. And it that's a pretty standard in every state and federal appeal because they don't necessarily send the entire record. Gotcha. Um, you know, and, and most of the time you designate what you want. Just like in in the Eccles post-conviction appeal, uh, DNA request appeal that's pending before the Supreme Court in Arkansas right now. Um, his attorneys could decide, well, they need um, the all the pleadings that were filed with the DNA results over the course of the motions for new trial process. Or the state could decide that, that those things need to be part of the record so the, the Arkansas Supreme Court can see that he's had DNA testing and this is what he got. So, um, so that's basically, again, this predates the electronic access. And so I can't go to the Harris County record and see the actual order from the Court of Appeals because it's not uploaded. Now, if the case were to happen today and then two years from now, the the Court of Criminal Appeals or or the plaintiff asks for something to be filed and supplementing the record at the Court of Criminal Appeals, that order will be part of the court record. And in Harris County, I'll have access to it. So um, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. All right. <laughs> I went beyond your question. No, no, it's good stuff. Like it's so it's a lot more complicated than you realize. Mm -hmm. It yeah, it can be. That's why lawyers get paid the big bucks. Exactly. <laughs> so on September 15th, 1999, the Court of Criminal Appeals rendered its decision or issued its opinion. Um, basically they found that uh in an en banc opinion that was um, judges Womack, McCormick, Mansfield, Keller, and Kiesler. They found a pallet challenge to judgment of the Harris Criminal Court, Harris County Criminal Court convicting of capital murder in violation of Texas Penal Code 1903A and sentencing him to death pursuant to Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 37.071, Section 2G. Appellant convicted of murder and sentenced to die under Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 37071, Section 2G, argued that the trial court erred in excluding evidence of a plea offer of 55 years in prison because it showed that he was not death worthy. The court found the evidence more prejudicial than probative under Texas Rule of Evidence 403 because the different motives for the offer would confuse the jury. Appellant also argued that the trial court erred in omitting an instruction about the nature of his involvement in the crime, but the court rejected that argument because appellant requested the omission. The court then overruled Powell versus State um, to the extent that it allowed a defendant to raise his error and action that he or she procured. The court found that there was no burden of proof as to victim impact evidence. 
The court affirmed the judgment, holding that evidence of an offer of 55 years in prison was prejudicial because motives behind it were confusing. That appellant could not raise jury instruction omission as an error when he requested it, and that there was no burden of proof for victim impact evidence. There was a concurrence uh, authored by Judge Keller and joined by Judge Kiesler, which found that while the legislator may have intended when it formulated the deliberateness special issue to require something in addition to intent or knowledge for assessment of the death penalty, the anti-parties issue appears to be included in the statute merely to require that the defendant be found to bear personal moral culpability for the victim's death. Although the deliberateness charge was required in every case, the anti-parties charge is required only when the jury charge permits conviction upon the law of parties. And while the word deliberately in common usage appears to encompass more than intentional conduct, the words intended and anticipated in the anti-parties issue appear to encompass the same or less culpability than the couple, couple of mental states required for establishing the fence of capital murder. So in some cases, a jury's finding of guilt will be the functional equivalent of an affirmative answer to the anti-party special issue, such as the case before us. And um, then there were two dissents, the first by Judge Holland, joined by Judges Myers and Price, in the instant case, there's no question that in order for the jury to have determined appellant deathworthy, it had to refer return an affirmative finding on the anti-party special issue. Thus, the special issue was an element the jury had to find to establish a capital murder punishable by death. And that's according to Boykin versus State, which is a Court of Criminal Appeals case from 1991, and Powell. Accordingly, because there was no jury finding on the anti-party special issue, the trial court had no authority to assess appellant sentence as death. With these concerns in mind, I must respectfully dissent. So they basically would say he has to be resentenced. Uh, and then there was Judge Johnson's dissent, which said the majority chooses to ignore the state's participation in the invited error. What is sauce for the gander is sauce for the goose. The statements of defense counsel, as noted by the majority, are found in trial volume six at 181. The trial court agreed to delete special issue number two without objection by the state, which is volume six at 182. Judge Johnson was unable to find anything in the record to support the majority statement that the trial court forbade the state from asking the prospective jurors about the anti-party charge in voir dire examination during the punishment charge conference the following exchange took place the court asked anything from the state as to any objection to the court's proposed court's charge miss sigler answered no sir the court asked any specially requested charges miss sigler again answered no sir if appellant invited error then the state is equally equally culpable in that invitation if appellant must suffer the consequences of invited error, so then so must the state. Because the state did not object to the deletion of the required instruction at the time the trial court agreed to delete it, or when specifically queried by the court as to possible objections, I would hold that in not objecting to the error, the state thereby elected to waive the death penalty as it may do in any capital case. The appropriate resolution would then be for this court to reform the sentence to life, and Judge Johnson dissented. Uh, but again, the, the uh, majority. I'm, I'm trying, like, I'm my head spinning, to be honest. Yeah. Well, it's common, and and what Price Stash was arguing is that the Supreme Court has found that in some cases, some errors are not waivable, uh, that they are structural, that they affect the entire fairness of the underlying trial, yeah. and that therefore the only remedy is a new trial. Right. Um, the majority basically said Price Dash asked for this to be eliminated. He can't now turn around and say, ah, uh -uh, the judge, the judge should not have eliminated this. 
Mm. And because the judge eliminated it, I can't be sentenced to death. Which I think is equitable. I mean, yeah, that and, seems fair. Yeah. If the yeah. if the court does what you ask it to do. Yeah, exactly. And again, I think that I don't think you can argue that the state, the state just, you know, didn't object to what Price Dash wanted to do. And the reason the judge eliminated that that particular special issue was because price dash was arguing that it wasn't constitutional. So, um, but no, I don't think, I don't think that the state participated by not objecting. Yeah. I agree. Based on the defendant's argument for why he didn't want that issue uh, given to the jury. And, you know, really, in reality, the jury probably could have answered, you know, yes, he did cause her death. Because while he didn't pull the trigger, he brought the man with the gun. Absolutely. He provided the gun. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so um, the mandate issued for the direct appeal uh, affirmance on October 11th, 1999. Price Dash did file a petition for writ of certiorari on March third, uh, March tenth, two thousand, and his petition was denied, making his conviction and sentence final on May seventeenth, two thousand. Uh, he went on to state post conviction. Um, his attorney was Richelieu Edward Whelan. The initial. Uh, case was filed in the 230th district court on October 15th, 1998. Uh, there were proceedings in the, um, the trial court over the course of the next several years. And then on March 3rd, 2004, everything was transferred to the court of criminal appeals where it was um, given writ number WR-58537-01 on May uh, April 28, 2004, in an unpublished order or opinion, the Court of Criminal Appeals denied relief. Um, again, this predates electronic records. And so I have no idea what he claimed, what issues he raised, or anything, you know, anything that went on uh, in the trial court. It's very disappointing. Then he went on to federal habeas. Uh, again, Richelieu Edward Whelan was representing him. Um, this one's kind of goofy because they filed a civil action under docket number 04-01843, and that was in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas. The district judge was Nancy F. Atlas, the Honorable Nancy F. Atlas. Um, on A motion to appear was filed on May 4th by Whelan, and then an order was filed on May 4th that transferred this action to a miscellaneous case, 04-MC-0136, also in the uh, Southern District of Texas. Um, counsel in that case was also Richelieu Edward Whelan. William Scott Helfen, David B. Adler, and Christine Kirchner were also eventually enrolled as counsel. Uh, there was a motion to appear filed by Whelan. And then um, the uh, 1843 was transferred into the miscellaneous case. The civil case was transferred to the miscellaneous case. An order appointing counsel was entered on June 16, 2004, appointing William Scott Helfen and David B. Adler. Um, then a notice of appearance was filed on the 25th of June by Christine Kirchner and a notice of appearance was filed by Adler on July 1st. 
The state court records were filed in multiple volumes between November 19, 2004 and January 31, 2005. An unopposed motion to set a briefing schedule was filed on April 27, 2005. A motion for expansion of the record was filed on 8, uh, August 17, 2005 by Price Dash. Uh, and then another administrative shakeup happened and the case was transferred to docket number 05-CV-01546. Uh, but it picked up as though it had never been in those other two uh, matters. Counsel in that case was Helfen, Adler, uh, Stephen John Knight, David Dow, and Jeffrey Newbury uh, over the course of the habeas claims. A petition for writ of habeas corpus was filed on April 28, 2005. A notice from the clerk was issued on April 29th, advising of the new case number being assigned. Uh, an order was issued on May 5th, 2005, setting a briefing schedule. Uh, the warden filed a motion to quash the subpoena Dukas Tecum to um, the Harris County Courts seeking jury records. Uh, and that was filed on July 28, 2005. On July 29th, the district court judge entered an order uh, that discovery was not authorized in the case. And while the subpoena was quashed, the state was ordered to go ahead and get those records and file them into the record. So in, in essence, on September 21st, 2005, the motion to expand the record with those records was granted. Um, then there was a like an amended petition for uh, habeas corpus filed on July, uh, January 19th, 2006 with a copy of the FBI of an FBI complaint lodged by price stash and a letter from a psychologist that apparently talked about price stash's mental condition. Uh, the warden filed a motion for summary judgment on April 24th, 2006. Uh, so, Again, this is another case where I need to do a summary before I can go any further. Basically, Price Dash's petition was raising several claims for the first time on federal review. <clears throat> the warden had filed a motion for summary judgment, arguing in part that the habeas court could not consider the merits of Price Dash's unexhausted claims. Specifically, the warden argued that relief should be denied because Price Dash failed to give the state courts an opportunity to consider the following claims. That the prosecution suppressed evidence and presented false testimony res with respect to the voluntariness of co-defendant Howard Guidry's confession and the existence of a federal complaint relating to police misconduct. That the prosecution improperly exerted peremptory challenges against members of a cognizable racial group in violation of Batson versus Kentucky, that Price Dash's trial appellate and state habeas attorneys provided constitutionally ineffective assistance, and that the trial court improperly removed several prospective jurors for cause. Um, and real quick, Batson deals with um, a prosecutor inappropriately striking members of the jury veneer based on their membership in a protected class such as race, sexual orientation, gender, religion. Um, usually most, most frequently it's a racial claim. And what is happening is the, the court of public opinion believes that African-American people don't like to sentence people to death. So regardless of the race of defendant, some attorneys are arguing that eliminating African-Americans from the jury 
ensured that the the uh, defendant would be sentenced to death and that made it not fair trial and again the, the obvious question why is this being raised 20 wait no 10 years after why didn't he raise any of this stuff in the moment? Well, that's they're arguing that the uh, the trial appeal and state habeas attorneys were ineffective. There so they're raising that and saying, but the attorneys weren't effective. So that's why it wasn't raised before. Got it. Um, a lot of ineffective counsels out there. <laughs> he's he's never alleged actual innocence. So he doesn't even he's not even trying to get these unexhausted claims to bootstrap them in with a claim of actual innocence. So I, I kind of don't, I don't get it. All right. So on August 25th, 2006, the court denied the motion for summary judgment filed by the warden and stayed and administratively closed the case to allow state court review. Uh, so Price Dash was ordered to expeditiously seek state court relief and move to reopen these proceedings, if necessary, soon after the conclusion of the successive state court proceedings. So he goes back to the 230 30th District Court. By this time, uh, the judge is now the Honorable Belinda Hill, who apparently hated Robert Frada. Uh, according in the world, according to fraud, at least counsel for the state was Roe Wilson and counsel for price dash was Kurt Wentz. Uh, price dash filed an application on February 12th, 2007. It was forwarded to the T uh, to the court of criminal appeals on February 20th and was assigned writ number 58 uh, to 58537-02. Um, he filed a formal 11.71 application on October 15, 2008. He did make four allegations, uh, and I'm guessing that they were the same ones summarized by the uh, federal judge, but I don't have the actual application, so I'm not going to go out on that limb. Uh <laughs> On December 17, 2008, the Court of Criminal Appeals entered an order uh, saying they had reviewed the application and find that part of Allegation 1, applicants claim that the state suppressed evidence with respect to the volunte voluntariness of his co-defendant's confession, satisfied the requirements of Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 11.071, Section 5A. Accordingly, as to that claim, they found that the requirements for consideration of a sub subsequent application had been met and the cause was remanded to the trial court for consideration. Uh, on December 12, 2011, uh, apparently there were, there were pleadings, there were hearings filed over that three years. And then on December, tw uh, December 2, 2011, Price Dash and the state each filed their proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. On August 1st, 2012, the Court of Criminal Appeals issued an order uh, ordering the trial court to resolve the pending matters within 90 days. And so on September 25th, 2012, the court entered her findings of fact and conclusions of law, basically adopting the state's findings and the conclusions entered by the trial court were that Price Stash had failed to show that the state suppressed a future legal finding and holding that Gidry's confession was not voluntary because he was tricked by detectives. And we're going to talk about that in depth next week. Um, but that's basically, and I think it was alluded to by Frada as well because he tried to challenge his conviction based on flaws in Gidry and Price Dash's confessions and their claims that those confessions were coerced. Um, he did win a new trial because those confessions were not found to be credible by his federal district court judge, but 
he was still convicted without those confessions being entered in his 2009 trial. So again, we'll talk about Gidry next week yeah. or two weeks from now, two weeks. Yes. When I say next week, I mean two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> next time we meet. Yes. Those songs. <laughs> uh, find, uh, conclusion number two was that Price Dash failed to show that information about any flaws in Gidry's confession uh, that was the federal court's future legal holding was material, uh, i.e. that the results of Price Dash's trial would have been different in light of the overwhelming evidence of Price Dash's guilt. Price Dash failed to show, this is number three, that Price Dash failed to show that any flaw in the taking of Guidry's confession impacted the voluntariness of his non-custodial oral admissions and written statement. Number four, Price Dash failed to show harm based on the sparse testimony about Gidry's confession and testimony concerning the information supplied by Gidry being cumulatively supplied by other witnesses, including Price Dash by his own confession. Number five, Price Dash failed to meet the burden of showing that the state presented false testimony concerning the voluntariness of Gidry's confession and failed to show that A, the state presented false testimony, B, the falsity was material and that there was a reasonable likelihood that affected the jury's judgment and see that the state used the testimony knowing it was false. And finally, number six was price dash failed to demonstrate that his conviction was unlawfully obtained and the judge recommended that relief be denied. On um, September 25th, the, the trial judge also issued a, a companion order uh, basically ordering the clerk to prepare a transcript of all papers and send them to the Court of Criminal Appeals uh, as provided by Article 11.071 and that the clerk was ordered to send a copy of the findings of fact and conclusions of law to all uh, counsel and um, the Harris County DA. Then in on October 17, 2012, as two volumes of a supplemental record were received at the Court of Criminal Appeals. On March 27, 2013, the Court of Criminal Appeals adopted the trial court's findings and conclusions with the exception of the findings of fact at paragraphs 73 and 74. Basically, they didn't agree that the state was unaware of the future credibility findings and legal conclusions of the federal district court and that the federal court's authority to hold a de novo hearing was undermined or undermined its credibility findings basically the fifth circuit said they didn't have she didn't have authority to hold a hearing and so her credibility determinations as the judge in harris county saw it were undermined um the court of criminal appeals didn't agree with that particular finding um and basically i think because the record established that the detectives knew that the way they were getting Gidry to talk to them was not kosher because it was a future legal holding that it was wrong, but they knew at the time it was wrong. Uh, I think that's kind of the, the reasoning. Um, and then and what Paris, specifically were they doing that wasn't kosher? Well, what they did basically was get, uh, Gidry had been arrested on a bank robbery charge. Right. And he had been appointing counsel. And his counsel probably had said, don't talk to anybody about anything. And so when they initially approached Gidry, Gidry said, my attorney said not to talk to you about anything. So then the detectives left the room and they said, well, we called your attorney. Oh. And he said, you can talk to us about this. Uh, and I think that they were under the mistaken belief because there, there is Supreme Court law that says um, if you're being questioned about something you haven't been charged with, the Sixth Amendment right to counsel doesn't attach. And I think they kind of confused it because there are nuances. Right. But what they should have done was perhaps 
not said your and and the attorney they basically never talked to him. Yeah. And I think that's where the that's where the um the really bad part comes. Yeah, for sure. Is you lied and said you talked to the attorney and the attorney <clears throat> said it was okay when in fact you never talked to the attorney. But it's been a long time since I looked at Gidry's case. So I may have the facts confused. Um, so I will, you know, I'll, I'll have more detail later, but yeah, basically they tricked Gidry. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah. You know, cops are okay to, you know, you don't have to always play straight with the evidence. You can say, oh, we have some evidence against you, but mm -hmm. you know, yeah. lying about what your counsel said. Right. But, you know, and that's the thing too, that they could have because of, because he hadn't been charged. And that attorney didn't represent him on the crimes he had been charged with. They could have gone about it another way. And as long as he cooperated and, and didn't say, I want a lawyer. They could have talked to him. Right. Uh, because the right to counsel. Is. Oftentimes specific to a particular case and it's usually not always but usually specific to a crime that's actually been charged that's interesting so um and gidry doesn't strike me as a person to have you know i mean they could have even said to gidry well he doesn't represent you for this he represents you for the bank robbery. And we're not here about that. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this done on Law and Order. Um, we're not here about that. This <laughs> is what we want to talk to you about. And then Gidry strikes me as the type that would have said, oh, okay. <laughs> and probably just talked to him anyway. Right. So, um, again, you know, he was not a Mensa member. And he was he was not a person that it would take a whole hell of a lot to trick. Right. Um, so, uh, but moving back to get about back to price stash, um, they didn't agree with uh, paragraph number 95 finding that the state cannot suppress Gidry's future legal findings and the federal court's credibility determinations were undermined by the Fifth Circuit's holding regarding the judge's authorization to hold a hearing. Um, Paragraph 119, that the imputed knowledge is inapplicable to the state because the federal court's decision was a future legal conclusion unknown at the time of Price Stash's trial. And again, I think the reason that they disagree with that finding is that the conduct occurred in 1994. And it's that conduct that is the problem, regardless of how it came to light or when it came to light. Um, and then paragraphs 116 and 118, uh, they disagreed with the trial court's analysis of Price Stass's burden to show presentation of false evidence concerning the voluntariness of Giddy's confession and its finding that Price Stash did not meet the third prong of uh I don't know how I, I pronounce this Gilio. Uh, but it's spelled G-I-G-L-I-O. It could be anything. Giglio. Who knows? Um, it could be Julio. <laughs> yeah, it sounds as good as anything else, right? Yeah. And then uh, they didn't agree with the conclusions of law at paragraph number one, that he failed to show that the state suppressed a future legal finding, and paragraph five, that he failed to meet the burden of showing that the state presented false testimony concerning the voluntariness of Gidry's confession. However, uh, based upon the findings and conclusions that they did accept and their own review, they denied relief. They further found that Price Stash's remaining claims failed to meet any of the exceptions provided for in Article 11.71071, Section 5, and therefore dismissed them as abuse of the writ without considering the merits of the claims. So then he goes back to federal court and he's again before uh, Judge Nancy Atlas, Honorable Nancy Atlas. 
in Southern District of Texas. Uh, he's got same counsel, although David Adler had withdrawn in on October 30th, 2009. Uh, he's got Stephen Knight, David Dow, and Jeffrey Newberry. Uh, the, an order was issued on September 30th, 2013, ordering Price Dash to file an advisory of the status of the state court proceedings within 20 days. Uh, Price Dash did file a motion to lift stay on October 18th, 2013. An order was entered on the 24th of October, uh, granting the motion to lift, lift stay and reopening the case and ordering the parties to, to submit a joint proposed scheduling order within 30 days. On December 3rd, 2013, the court granted a motion for extension of time, uh, ordering that the point proposed scheduling order be filed jointly within 30 days. Price Dash filed a brief in support of his position for writ of habeas corpus on March 31st, 2014. Uh, the warden was granted an extension of time to respond by June, June 30th, 2014, on April 29th, 2014, uh, on April, on September 11th, 2014, an order was filed, um, basically granting an additional extension of time, uh, to file amended pleadings because Price Dash wanted to amend his writ or his petition. Uh, his, his amended petition was due by November 11th. The answer would be due by January 14th, 2014 or 2015 rather, and then any reply would be due by February 17th. Another motion for extension of time was granted on November 14th. On um, January 14th, 2015, yet another motion for extension of time was granted with the amended petition being due by February 26th, the answer by April 27th, and the reply by June 29th. Price Dash filed his amended petition on February 26, 2014. Uh, he claimed his claims were that the prosecution suppressed evidence under Brady versus Maryland and presented false testimony under Gilea, uh, Gilea versus United States. With respect to the voluntariness of a co-defendant's testimony and the existence of an FBI complaint relating to Price Dash's confession, the prosecution improperly exerted peremptory challenges against members of a cognizable racial group in violation of Batson versus Kentucky. The trial court improperly limited the testimony of a defense witness in the punishment phase. The trial court violated the Constitution by admitting in evidence allegedly prejudicial and inflammatory crime scene photographs at trial. Price Dash's trial and appellate and state habeas attorneys provided constitutionally ineffective assistance of counsel. The state improperly removed several prospective jurors with peremptory strikes because of their views on capital punishment. The trial court improperly limited the presentation of evidence relating to the prosecution's plea offer. The trial court failed to submit the anti-party special issue in the punishment phase. Texas 1210 rule violates the United States Constitution. Texas violates the Constitution by not placing a burden of proof on the prosecution with regard to the mitigation special issue. The trial court unconstitutionally failed to limit the jury's consideration of unadjudicated prior offenses, and the trial court improperly instructed the jury concerning the mitigation special issue. on that's a lot you need a glass of water after that yes i did <laughs> i do my apologies and i know people can hear me drinking and i think emily does a really great job of getting rid of those noises <laughs> unless we're also talking and then it makes it very difficult for her bless her uh, shout out to emily walker who has been editing our audio files that have been going up on captivate um and I'll give a mid-show or toward the end of the show shout out to Roberta Glass for the wonderful intro and Adi for the thumbnails for our uh, video episodes and the thumbnail for, you know, Facebook and all our social media. So thank you, team. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> all right.
Hey, so sorry, on I've April. got a random, this is kind of a okay. random question of just, why are all of these things filed by the warden? Is that just sort of the way that the system works since, you know, the, you know, it's a prisoner in the state, uh, you know, being incarcerated by the state. Is that why all of these things are yes. filed by the warden? As, as the, yes. Uh, either the, the warden, defendant or the, you know. The warden is the official defendant. Got it. So he's, the warden is the official defendant. Yes. Yeah. Generally, the Texas AG's office handles defense, and they are defending the conviction, right? Not necessarily the warden, but yeah, that's why the warden. Um, yeah. it's always so it's strange. Named. It doesn't say the state of Texas. It's always like the warden. It's correct. Um, and that is not that because... he's actually, you know, not that the wardens are the ones actually filling out all the paperwork, but mm -hmm. it's just the way that the system works. Correct. Uh, they're the nominal, you know, the right. nominal because they're the yeah. person having custody. Yeah, that makes sense. Habeas corpus means having the body. At least the body, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and that's why Damien Eccles can't get his post conviction or post uh, post Alfred plea. And post SIS expiring um, DNA testing. Because even if the results are exculpatory, there is nothing the court can do because right. he's not in custody. So, yeah, that's total sense. Not, <laughs> but he just doesn't, you know, he's like, I'm, I'm under this, under this cloud of a felony conviction. Oh, poor baby, shut the hell up. <laughs> and he's here. I, you know, he's in New Orleans somewhere. Oh, he is? And I hope to God I never see him because I would have a really hard time. I mean, first of all, you can't miss him because he dresses like a character out of the freaking Lord of the Rings with the stupid pants and the long yeah, black. That is true. And the, the stupid beard. And the shaved head with the mohawky crap going on, like he looked at the hearing. I mean, you know, he looks like a ref a refugee from Comic Con. Yeah, exactly. He's the <laughs> he missed the Harry Potter, uh, the Harry Potter. He looks I like mean, the dude. guy in Harry Potter that had all the animals. Hagrid. Yeah. She, no, because he's kind of he's kind of sort of a oompa loompa. <laughs> He's not very tall. That is very he, true. he and Baldwin and, and Miss Kelly are all kind of oompa loompas. Yeah, that is very true. <laughs> so yeah, they're not tall men. Right. Uh and I mean, even the late Robbie Coltrane, even though Hagrid was a giant and so thus made bigger on screen, I think Robbie Coltrane was over six feet tall. No, it got, yeah, I believe that because he was definitely big in the movies. He was just he a was big, a big, big guy, man. yeah. He was a big, man. big guy, yeah. So, all right. Um, on April twenty first, twenty fifteen, the warden was granted an extension of time to answer the amended petition. Uh, his answer was due by June twenty sixth, twenty fifteen. He filed his answer on, or she filed, because I think it was Lori Davis by that time. Uh, an answer was filed on behalf of the warden on June 24th. And a motion for summary judgment was also filed. Then um, price stash, there was a motion for clarification as, a, as to extension of time in exhibits. And I think that was an earlier extension of time with a reply deadline. The April 21st extension of time didn't set a reply deadline. It only set the deadline for the clerk, uh, for the, excuse me, for the um, answer. So I think they were trying to get a date for the, for the reply. Uh, and on July 23rd, that was July 17th, July 23rd, the motion for clarification was granted and the reply was do on or before August 24, 2015. Price Ash did file his reply on that date. 
The court issued a memorandum and opinion on March 17, 2016. For the reasons discussed above, Price Dash has not shown an entitlement to federal habeas relief. Uh, it's therefore ordered that respondent William Stevens' motion for summary judgment is granted. It's further ordered that Josephina Price Dash's petition for writ of habeas corpus is denied with prejudice. It's further ordered that no certificate of appealability will issue in this case. So the judge basically analyzed all 10 of the claims. How many claims were there? Um, yeah, all 12 of the claims and found that um, they were not sufficiently proven or they had no, they weren't material um, and therefore would not have impacted Price Stash's conviction. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, she denied relief. Uh, final judgment was entered on the same date. Uh, Price Dash was granted an extension of time to file a notice of appeal, which must was due on or before May 16, 2016. Uh, on April 27, 2016, David Dow was substituted, um, or act actually a motion to substitute was filed by David Dow to replace Helfand. And that order, that motion was granted on uh, May 4th, 2016. A notice of appeal was filed on May 16th, 2016. And David Dow was with, was with the University of Houston Law Center. And he did a lot of, uh, a lot of death penalty post-conviction. And if we look at uh, the, the claims against Sharon Keller, which I would like to do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about David Dow. Uh, he's kind of disappeared lately. David Dow has. Yeah, he's kind. I haven't seen his name in in probably three or four years now. Um, he retired, or is it something else? He may have retired. Um, he had gotten in some trouble with the Court of Criminal Appeals. So he went through a period of time where he was suspended from practicing before them for a month or two and, and or a period of time, whether it was 30, 60, 90 days. Um, and then I think that that also impacted his ability to practice in federal court. So, but again, uh, we'll look at, you know, I might look at um, one of the cases that he was involved in that resulted in spurious allegations against Sharon Keller mm. that were unfounded. Um, and that's what I would, I would be more interested in talking about is, you know, why they were unfounded. So we'll, we'll look at that. So uh, the case went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal. It was assigned docket number 16-70014 on May 18, 2016. Counsel there was David R. Dow and Jeffrey R. Newberry. Uh, they filed a motion for COA and brief in support on August 15, 2016, because under, under EDPA, in order to appeal the denial of relief in federal habeas corpus from a state conviction, you have to get a certificate of appealability either from the district court or from the, the circuit court of appeal. Um, otherwise you can't appeal the, the district court becomes the final say. And, uh, the warden filed an opposition to his motion for COA on October 14, 2016. Price Dash replied on October 31st. And the court, uh, court of Appeal ruled on April 26, 2017. It held that because the reasoning underlying Martinez Trevino did not extend to claims that could generally be brought on direct appeal, and the inmate cited no case law at any level adopting such an extension 
and the district court's rejection of Martinez Trevino as cause for the defaulted Batson claim was not debatable. The inmate's Batson claim was brought up for the first time in a COA application. Defendant's words, either in the form of his confession or what he told his girlfriend, did not factor into the analysis when the court found the Brady violations were material in co-defendant's case. The inmate's briefing did not address the merits ruling through his counsel, though his counsel discussed that at argument, and this failure to adequately challenge on the grounds the district court relied on in rejecting his claim rendered the request for a COA moot. Martinez Trevino are two Supreme Court cases that basically give um, defendants kind of a second bite at the apple to raise ineffective assistance of counsel claims. And because I suspect that this will also be an issue in Guidry's case, I will do a little bit more research on those two claims, those two cases, so that I can kind of provide listeners with an explanation of what they mean. But uh, Frada tried to use them to get some of his uh, unexhausted and or um, defaulted claims in federal and state court because he felt like, you know, his attorneys, he wanted to raise these things. His attorneys wouldn't do it. That brings him into Martinez Trevino. And so uh, the application for a COA was denied and that thus ends the Fifth Circuit appeal. Uh, the mandate issued on the same date and Price Dash did file a petition for rehearing on May 10th, 2017. An order was entered on the on June 27, 2017, denying that petition for rehearing. Um, basically, Price Dash filed a petition for writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court on September 25th, 2017. However, it appears that he only raised the issue of whether the Eighth Amendment's reliability requirement is satisfied by Texas capital sentencing system that does not specify what degree of proof must be met before unadjudic offenses can be offered as aggravating evidence in capital trials. Um, the petition itself is not available online, but based on the response in opposition and the reply, that appears to be the sole issue raised. Again, could be wrong. Um, an order was entered on October 26, 2017, granting a response, uh, an extension of time to respond to the petition. That brief in opposition was filed November 27, 2017. Uh, Price Dash replied on December 13, 2017. The petition was conferenced on January 5, 2018, and an order was entered on January 8th, 2018, denying the petition. There were no memoranda issued. Um, so it appears to have been a decision of the full court with no dissent from any of the more liberal members. Mm. And um, that is it. Uh, Price Stash is still on death row. Uh, Kim Og, the district attorney for Harris County, has not sought a an execution date for him yet she could because his conviction he's gone all the way up to the supreme court on federal habeas review and um so that is something that could happen or or could not she has not really been very expeditious about setting execution dates no, she's definitely likes the criminals out on the street. Now, I don't get that. I don't get that impression. Although, like I said, I think there's some hesitance on her part. Although she did, she requested a date for Frada and got it. And he was executed on the 10th of January. Yeah. And yeah, I, it may, maybe I'm thinking of somebody else, but I, I feel like Harris County is one of those two that's had a lot of this defund the police. Let's don't really prosecute people. Well, they've had they and they have had problems like I think they had problems at their crime lab at one yeah. time. So 
but she like Linda Cardi and Charles Victor Thompson, uh, both of them have exhausted everything state and federal. Um, she could have asked for dates on them. Uh, Price, Dash, and Guidry have both exhausted. So she could have, at the time she requested a date for Frada, she could have requested a date for Price, Dash. Yeah, it is interesting that, yeah, that he's, that Frada went first and the other two are still, mm -hmm. still there. Yeah. So, so uh, but that is, that's Price, Dash, the case against Price, Dash. Um, and I, again, mainly it's his admissions and his written statement that prove his guilt. He's never claimed actual innocence. Yeah, that's um, what's crazy to me. He's never actually claimed he was innocent, right? Isn't that strange? So, well, I think what he's argued is his death sentence is faulty because of the uh, failure to provide the anti-parties charge mm -hmm. but again I, I think that's um i think that based on his participation because he played he played more of a role than just finding the trigger man and hooking him up with frada and then yeah. washing his hands you know he provided the gun to gidry which he got from frada he took right. Gidry to Farah's home, left him there, and waited to pick him up and bring him away from the crime scene. He got rid of his own car. You know, so his role was a lot more active than just the usual mid middleman in a murder for hire plot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he did, I mean, almost everything but pull the trigger, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. He ensured the trigger would be pulled. And he was the one in communication with Frada while they waited for Farrah to come home and kill her as well. So, all right. Well, I think that that pretty much does it. Uh, do you have any questions or any anything you want to look at next week when we talk about Gidry? Well, I think it's just trying to understand. I mean, again, this this case is really interesting again because you have the you have the three people, right? You have the Frada who actually, you know, set it all in motion, and then you know, Crytash, who's kind of the the more than the middleman, and then Gidry, who's the actual trigger man. It's just, it's a fascinating case. All of these people together, who you know. Mm -hmm three people come together to commit a crime i you know it still just doesn't make any sense to me that you know if Frada just wants his kids it's about custody it just it's odd that somebody could care so much about custody for his children but then could just kill their mother in cold blood has no problem with that and i don't i don't think ultimately i think it was that ultimately i think it was that farah had exposed some of Frada's dirty laundry yeah and had made some statements about his proclivities because I'm not going to go into detail, but you know, y'all can look him up online. And he was a sick, sick, sick puppy. I mean, right. perversion is mild. Well, I think you're right. I think there had to be something else going on. Well, you got to remember, he was a public safety officer. Yep. And these types of allegations, and I think plus, you know, again, he was very charming, and but he was also an antisocial personality. So he was a public safety officer because he thought of prestige and he could do what he wanted. Yeah, he didn't want to help yeah. people. It wasn't to help people. It yeah. was prestige and do what he wanted and get women. And, you know, so Farrah's allegations or Farrah's exposure of him uh, could have impacted his job. 
especially if Missouri City, you know, public safety officers in the 90s had any kind of moral turpitude clauses. Yeah. You know, and um, and I think he was a bully, too, to some extent, you know, that he would somebody gives him a bad check. And so he'd go get price dash to go beat the guy up. I mean, you know, grow up, dude. <laughs> right. So, but yeah, I think, you know, Frada's complex um, personality disorders were uh, what what led to this. And, and he just thought he was going to get out of paying support. He was going to have the kids, but it wasn't for the good of the kids. And yeah, it was just more for him and his pocketbook. We we didn't really talk about this last week, but right after Farrah was murdered, the kids were taken away from him and 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 given to Lex and Betty. And then Frada had to start paying support to Lex and Betty. Mm. So a judge found that Frada was not fit to uh to raise the kids or to have custody of them. So, you know, there was a lot going on. And maybe he thought that this would would stop it and then he would, you know, come out on top. But that didn't that didn't happen. So, and Mary Gibb could have gotten them all arrested right away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But she chose not to say anything. So, all right. Well, you ready to call it? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for all your work. It's great. Thank you. All right. Thank you for listening to Based in Fact, a true crime podcast with Lisa O'Brien and Kyle Evans. If you like the show and you want to know more, you can find us on Facebook or follow me on Twitter at O'Brien LN. Join us in two weeks for episode four, State of Texas versus Howard Paul Guidry. In part three, we'll wrap, out, wrap up our look at the tragic murder of Farrah Frada with a look at the case against Guidry, the trigger man. We'll talk about his initial conviction, direct appeal, successful federal habeas claim, his retrial and direct appeal, and the course of his state and federal post-conviction claims as he and Prystash await their own execution dates on Texas death row. Until then, have a great two weeks and stay safe. Thank you.